Give us one hour and we'll help you change the way you think about happiness. Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen is a fresh talk radio approach promoting happiness from the inside out. Happiness is a choice and happiness can be cultivated and harvested. Each week, Lisa shines her light on well-being and global human flourishing by presenting a diverse and proactive collection of the greatest thinkers and doers who have devoted their lives to creating a better world in which to live. Lisa Cypress Kamen is a widely recognized applied positive psychology coach, author, documentary filmmaker, and lecturer specializing in the fields of sustainable happiness, mindfulness, and integrated well-being. Let's get to it. Here's your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen. Welcome to Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio, broadcasting consciously prepared brain food from the beaches of Malibu, California. Each week we explore the very serious business of happiness, sustainable well-being, and human flourishing. We are not talking about that annoying yellow smiley face. No, no, no. We are talking about something much deeper and critical to the success of humanity. Authentic happiness is not selfish, egotistical, or narcissistic. In fact, it is essential in order for humankind to thrive. Sustainable happiness is important because it not only elevates our own well-being locally, but also contributes to collective global flourishing. The achievement of a happy life is not only positively good for us, it is constructively good for those around us. In short, happiness matters. Happiness comes from the heart, and this show is most definitely all about the heart. Today we're talking about our search for meaning, the pursuit and desire for a meaningful life. And with me in the studio today is Ralph White. He is the co-founder of the New York Open Center, the city's leading center of holistic learning for the past 32 plus years. He is the author of the new memoir, The Jeweled Highway, on the quest for a life of meaning. He has directed for 20 years a series of conferences on the lost spiritual history of the West and also on the art of dying, spiritual, scientific, and practical approaches to living and dying. Ralph White also edited the Lapis Magazine for six years, winner of the Alternative Press Award from the Utney Reader. Born in Wales, he came to the U.S. as a Fulbright Scholar, His life has placed him at the heart of the movement for holistic consciousness for the last 40 years. He's a world traveler, a public speaker, a creative director, editor, and conference director. He introduced and edited the anthology, The Rosicrucian Enlightenment Revisited, which emerged from the Esoteric Quest Conference series that he has founded. Welcome, Ralph. Thanks for joining us. Well, my pleasure. Lovely to be here. Lovely to have you. What set you on your quest for meaning? Well, I was one of those children who, when I was nine or ten years old, was basically asking, what are we here for? What, are, what is the point of all of this? What is, uh, what is this thing, life? And the, uh, the conventional answers I got, as far as I can recall, were more to the fact, well, you grow up, you know, you, maybe you get married, you get a job, and then you die. I mean, it didn't really amount to much. Um, so at that rate, I think I was always from a very early age asking these basic existential questions. And I didn't grow up in a, an environment that was particularly conducive to a spiritual worldview, very much in, in austerity Britain in the aftermath of the Second World War. Um, I grew up with a sense, really, of the heaviness and the darkness around us, so I had to really set off on a personal quest. That, uh, that led me to a, a sense of a, a deeper order in the world beyond what we can just perceive with our senses. So I would say that that yearning for meaning is something that has always been with me from a very early age and that really launched me. I, when I got to university, I found what was offered in the way of philosophy was very insubstantive. It was something called logical positivism that people can barely remember these days, a form of <laughs> linguistic pedantry. It had certainly had nothing to do with the great questions that the great philosophers have engaged with. You know, of course, philosophy really means the love of wisdom, and uh, wisdom certainly, or the interest in wisdom certainly has disappeared from the philosophy departments of universities at that time. So I had to set out in search of my own understanding of that. So I would say that's what really got me going. And 
in a sense, that launched you as it does each one of us who pursue this quest for meaning on a hero's journey of sorts. Uh, well, I mean, yes, I don't want to sound inflated, but I, I think obviously Joseph Campbell was onto something profound when he spoke about the hero's journey. So, you know, it's just that basic journey where you have to leave the culture that uh, from which you emerged and set off, take various risks and adventures, head out into the unknown, have some kind of transcendent experience there, and then return to fructify the culture in some way. And I suppose you could say that that's been some kind of uh, archetypal process that I and thousands of other people have been through. What were some of the turning points along the way of your journey? Well, for me, uh, my... Uh, I was in graduate school in Chicago in 1970 and answered an ad for a co-driver to go to L.A. down Route 66, something I'd always wanted to do. And I think for me, uh, entering into the deserts of New Mexico and Arizona, the vast starlit skies, the huge silence, uh, hearing the pure sound of silence on 14th century Native American ruins in the painted desert, that had a hugely expansive impact on in me uh, in terms of it, it definitely expanded my consciousness. It opened me up. It began the process of opening me up spiritually, is what I would say, to a deeper order to the universe and to um, the whole, all the world's spiritual traditions that had not uh, been available to me in the conventional church teachings or the conventional philosophy that I had been exposed to in the, and more in the academic world. So that would, I would say that journey down Route 66 into the deserts, the spiritual impact of the deserts. I then, you know, I've always been an adventurer, so I started off when I was 23 to hitchhike to Machu Picchu. And uh, that journey, that too became a uh, a journey of discovery, a, a journey into uh, old ancient cultures, the Incan, the Mayan cultures, uh, the vastness of the uh, the mountains. Um, and then after being in the Andes for months, to come down to sea level again and to see industrial civilization, even if it was just in the form of uh, a Peruvian city called Arequipa, I saw it with fresh eyes. And I saw very clearly... Um, that Western industrial civilization was both deeply damaging our souls and really deeply damaging the planet. Uh, this was back in 1973. And, and you could say that um, that, uh, that really opened up an agenda for me, a sense that we need to create an alternative to the way we are go, were going and still are in many respects. We needed to create a holistic and ecological alternative to the predominant consumerism and materialism and obsession with economic growth, etc. So that provided an agenda for me, you might say, for my life's work, which has been to create these uh, learning centers and uh, magazines and all these various instruments and tools, conferences and so on, uh, that are all intended to awaken consciousness to the, the deepest dimensions of the world. And we know from from scientific research, you know, the flip side of uh, how to create happiness, how to create meaning out of life is to is one of the pathways is fostering a sense of curiosity and wonder and delight yes. as part of one's life process. Yes, and, well, absolutely. And, you know, I, I have two teenagers. You don't know this, but I'm sharing that I have two teenagers. Okay. And, yeah. and one of one of the things that I talk to my kids about is I don't really see that they're that curious. You know, everything is, mm. is quite accessible at their fingertips, right? They mm -hmm. have a question about something, they Google it. You know, they get the answer on the spot. But the notion of really digging deep and trying to suss out, to tease out the answers to the big questions – is something that I see the youth of today can be quite challenged by. Yeah, well, yeah, maybe it was a generational thing. You know, the 60s was certainly a time when these kinds of larger questions were being engaged with, and now so many young people, teenagers, children even, are just so sucked into the world of the Internet and high technology that they don't have the engagement with nature, with silence. Um, perhaps they don't have the, the, the kind of addiction to screens can certainly inhibit creativity. 
So I'm not sure what's going on. I mean, I think, I think it li- it's something that lives within all people of varying degrees, that curiosity. And uh, it, one can only hope that in the case of uh, uh, teenagers and others that it will emerge later in life or something will trigger it or a different aspect of their soul will unfold as they get older. I think that you're right, that it will happen later in life, because I think it is a part of our nature, you know, yeah. this, 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 this quest for meaning, to be curious about why things are the way they are, and it, that we don't always require a catastrophic event to catapult us onto this path. That's right. Uh, preferably, we, we, we won't have a catastrophic event. Exactly. Preferably, preferably, there'll be some inner prompting that will arise within us that will draw us towards, uh, whether it's art or literature or philosophy or science or whatever it may be, something that can help us um, come to terms with these inevitable paradoxes and questions that arise as we go through life. Who have been some of your most significant teachers on the path, on your journey? Well, you know, when I was young, Carl Jung was somebody, when I was trying to reconcile in my 20s a more spiritual worldview with the more intellectual side of me that had been very aware of the ugliness and horrors of the first half of the 20th century and didn't see any obvious deeper meaning in the world. Uh, I, was, I think it was Carl Jung who really enabled me to reconcile the, the intellectual and the spiritual sides of my being. So I have a huge amount of respect and appreciation for Jung, uh, to me, the great soul psychologist of the 20th century. And the other person who more recently can, has uh, been a great influence on me and a, a source of inspiration has been uh, Rudolf Steiner, the wonderful mm. um, Austrian-born um, Genius. I think one would have to say uh, the person who, without question, I think left the greatest holistic legacy of the 20th century in terms of biodynamic agriculture, Waldorf schools. Um, his followers created the, the Camp Hill Villages for special needs children and adults. But he's, uh, Rudolf Steiner, I think, is one of the great underappreciated resources that we have, those of us with holistic and spiritual interests. Uh, just his, well, you know, he's got 6,000 lectures and 350 books or so that uh, are a treasure trove of spiritual and esoteric wisdom. And uh, he's been a huge source of uh, insight and help for me. You are a treasure trove. We're going to need to take a break before we continue our discussion on the quest for meaning with Ralph White. To learn more, please visit ralphwhite.net or theopencenter.org. And once again, the book is The Jeweled Highway. On the quest for a life of meaning, you can find Ralph on Twitter at Ralph underscore White. We will be right back and we will continue the conversation about the journey uh, to suss out the meaning of it all. Here come the tunes. We will be right back. We know that life can be tough and that happiness can and does live alongside adversity. We'll be right back to explain how on Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen. Harvest more happiness by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness, following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen, and tweeting us with the hashtag Harvesting Happiness. Love to read? Looking to harvest your happiness? Then look no further. Lisa Cypress Kamen is an author of three amazing books that will assist in taking your well-being and self-mastery to the next level. Are we happy yet? Eight Keys to Unlocking a Joyful Life offers breakthrough strategies for creating your own personal happiness revolution. Perspectives on addiction an integrated journey to wellness is an overview of the recovery process from a multi-stepped perspective and holistic approach of substance abuse and lifestyle management. Through her third book, Reintegration Strategies for Depression, Anxiety, Anger, Grief, and Post-Traumatic Stress, offers an own nonsense approach to dealing with post-combat civilian life reintegration issues for veterans and their families. You'll find these books online at Amazon.com and HarvestingHappiness.com. 
Mindful meditative moments are free and relaxing on the spot mini staycation journeys designed to calm the mind and soothe the body from the comfort of wherever you are. No reservations or travel required. Check out the playlists on harvestinghappiness.com and Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio on iTunes and SoundCloud. Welcome back to Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress-Kamen, the show dedicated to promoting happiness from the inside out by thriving with passion, purpose, place, and meaning. So let's get back to the show and your host, Lisa Cypress-Kamen. Welcome back to Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio. If you're just joining us now, I urge you to download and share this podcast. Why? Because it's kind, free, legal, available 24-7, and we're talking about finding the meaning in life. The quest, you know, the search for meaning. What what are we doing here? What does this all mean? And my guest today is Ralph White. He is the co-founder of the New York Open Center, the city's leading center of holistic learning for the past several decades. He's the author of a new memoir, The Jeweled Highway, on the quest for a life of meaning. And he's directed conferences. Um, he's written. He's edited. He is uh, really quite a, a renaissance man in his own right. And Ralph, we were talking about some of the significant teachers that um, have influenced you in your life. And now I want to ask how they have been a direct influence on the work that you're doing in or and have done as directing learning centers such as Omega and the New York Open Center. You mean how have people like Jung and Steiner uh, influenced my work? Yes. Hmm. Well, that's a good question. That's not something I generally think of them as influencing my own. Well, first of all, they've just had a profound uh, impact in uh, helping me generate a feeling of wholeness, in providing uh, practices, meditative practices, um, insights about the nature of the psyche, insights about the nature of the higher worlds that have uh, just given me a sense of wholeness and a sense of being able to be in the world, and a sense of meaning and direction. So I would say Jung, you know, certainly contributed to my own certain, my own, the integration of different aspects of my being on a psychological level. And Steiner has just provided a kind of a mega picture that um, a larger context of, in, of meaning in which all of this kind of uh, work can flourish. So, so yes, as you were saying, I mean, I, I was program director of Omega Institute, uh, which our, our East Coast listeners would be familiar with. I ran the first two uh, summers there uh, in Rhinebeck, and then having been at the Open Center now for the last 30-plus years. Um, <clears throat> so I suppose you could say they have just... Um, deepened my conviction that uh, our culture is in profound need of spiritual and psychological renewal. And, um, and they've inclined me more to, uh, in, in, you know, embrace world culture, embrace all the different uh, traditions, perspectives that are coming from multiple spiritual paths, multiple uh, sources of wisdom. And in, in my experience and observation, that synergy, you know, that the ability to blend all of these different cultures into um, uh, a, a way of thinking and a way of being in the world where one can be more accepting, more loving, embracing of of all makes for a more uh, gentle experience of life itself. Yes, yeah, well, I think that is true, yeah. I mean, I think when we're, as you were saying, this show is about the heart, and I think once we basically gather that the essence of the human experience is centered in the heart, and that, uh, as, the, as the Beatles always said, they're in the, there's their final epitaph, and in the end, the love we take is equal to the love we make. I mean, those are truly wise words. And so uh, that is our task, is to to give and receive love as much as we possibly can. Yes, I and agree. And to go more deeply into the realms of wisdom. Mm. Talk a little bit about the New York Open Center, you know, a little bit about the format uh, and, and, and what's going on there now. 
Yeah, well, the Open Center, it's uh, currently uh, it's at 30th Street and Madison Avenue in Manhattan, midtown Manhattan, not far from the Empire State Building. Uh, it's been going since 1974. It provides a year-round set of programs, workshops, lectures, performances, conferences, national, international conferences, trainings, uh, in the whole spectrum of holistic learning. So whether that's pertains to the body and wellness, whether it pertains to uh, personal growth, psychological development, world mystical, contemplative, spiritual and esoteric traditions, or whether it's to do with uh, the arts and creativity or social and ecological transformation. These are all the topics that the Open Center has covered. And uh, we've had, you know, of course, when we started all those years ago, the conventional wisdom was, I'll never work in New York. You know, this is the real world, maybe California, yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> of course, now we've had uh, we've had well over three hundred thousand people come through the open center in that, during that time, and so you know it's an extraordinary thing to see how New York now has you know yoga centers in every fifth street corner, and of course Whole Foods is the biggest grocery store, whereas all of this stuff and con- complementary alternative integrative medicine is no longer considered weird and snake oil. So I think we can see that the open center, like many other centers, it has played a whole a role in bringing this more holistic and ecological worldview into the heart of the culture. So there we are, we're doing it, you know, seven days a week. (laughs) And uh, it's a nonstop experience. Oh, it's brilliant, actually. I I have uh, been to the Omega Institute. I have been there actually a couple of times up to Rhinebeck, New York, and taken Uh workshops. And that is a, it's a great experience to get out of the city, out of one's own normal routine. But the concept of doing this in the middle of an urban environment with the New York Open Center, to be able to come and take these, um, whether it's classes, workshops, conferences, whatever whatever is going on, whatever you're drawn to, in the middle of, you know, urban blight, some might say. Well, yes, especially the New York of 33 years ago. Um, yeah. But yes, that's exactly it. I, I would have many experiences in places like Omega or other re- retreat centers, etc. But then the question would be, how do we bring it back into the so-called real world? And that'd be that sort of dreaded moment of returning to the real world. Well, part of the idea of doing the open center was that we were going to be slap bang in the middle of the real world in the first place. And so there would not be that split between the ideal and the real and that actually people would just have to step out of the front door and they would be right there in the thick of the contemporary world. So I think that's it's played a role in integrating these new perspectives into contemporary culture. I would agree. In, in yoga, we often talk about how one takes the yoga off, uh, f- you know, from the mat and into the world. You know, how yeah, does the exactly. practice extend out into our daily life and i and i believe this is what you're speaking to with your programming yes yes well that's exactly it it's it's the spirituality of everyday life we can't just we can't always be sitting on a meditation pillow or having uh, deep serene contemplative experiences we have to bring it into the world and that's what the work of the Open Center certainly has been, and all of these centers, actually. And really, there's a whole worldwide network of holistic centers now, as I mentioned in my book. Um, so, yes, how do, we, how do we transform the culture? How do we move things in a, a more sane direction away from the dead-end materialism and consumerism that's gripped us for so long? In your book... Um I would love for you to read a passage or two. And yeah. uh, we were talking about rediscovering the lost spiritual history of the West. But anything that you would care to read, uh, our listeners would love to listen. Okay. Well, you know, I, um, as you mentioned at the outset, I've directed this series of conferences for uh, 20 years, uh, more than 20 years now, on on that topic, really, uh, the Western tradition, rediscovering the lost spiritual history of the West. I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, yoga and uh, Tibetan Buddhism and shamanism, etc., but I think it's also useful for us to 
those of us who have a Western or a European heritage, to look back at our own indigenous roots, our own spiritual tradition, the Western esoteric tradition, should we say. So this is a chapter, it's actually the concluding chapter of the book. It's called Rediscovering the Lost Spiritual History of the West in Praise of Bohemia. And it really speaks about <laughs> how this whole um, 20-year series of conferences, we're going to be doing one in August in Iceland, <laughs> an esoteric quest for the mysteries of the North in Iceland at the end of August. But this is how it all began. Okay, here, <clears throat> here we go. I've always been a Bohemian at heart, but little did I know that the country itself, or the Czech Republic, as it is now called, would open a door to the deep stream of wisdom known as the Western esoteric tradition that would become a spiritual focal point of my life and bring countless blessings. As the name suggests, Bohemia is the country most evocative of the, re of the Renaissance world of alchemists, Kabbalists, and hermetic philosophers, and an aura of magic and beauty still hangs over Prague. It was late one night in the early 90s in southern Bohemia's mecca of alchemists that I stumbled into a distant world and a door opened into my work on the renewal of the Western esoteric tradition. At a center's gathering in Bavaria, at a farm an hour east of Munich, I was traveling with a friend from a center called Zist, a kind of Ethelin in the Bavarian Alps. And when we, were, we entered a sleepy town nestled deep in the forests of the Samava Mountains. This region had been hidden behind the Iron Curtain for half a century, and few Westerners knew much about it. We passed beneath the stone archway and drove slowly along the dimly lit and deserted cobbled streets. We turned a corner and crossed a wide wooden bridge. Suddenly a high castle rose up from the river's edge. To its right was a tower, perfectly illuminated, that exuded a sense of harmony and proportion. This small town had one of the strongest auras of mystery I had ever encountered. It felt like we had passed through some kind of time war and were entering the 16th century. Mm. In the morning, is that enough, or uh, shall I go Ooh. on? Oh, I, well, uh, maybe a We've, little bit more, and then and then I want to uh, ask you a couple questions okay. about, about the right. global network. Yes. Okay. In the morning, when I threw open the casement windows of the Renaissance Seminary where we had spent the night, the room was filled with birdsong and the rushing of the Voltava River below. In the breakfast room, I noticed that the walls displayed large red roses on every side. It slowly began to dawn on me that we had entered the world of the Rosicrucian Enlightenment, mm -hmm. as described by the great historian Francis, Francis Yates. Um, mm -hmm. Lovely. So I, I think I'll just leave it there. So uh, I think yeah, that's... Yeah. We, we, want to, we want to tantalize and, 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 and attract the listeners to read the book, The Jeweled Highway <laughs> on the Quest for a Life of Meaning by Ralph White. Um, we are actually uh, nearly out of time, and I want to give our listeners your contact information. The websites are ralphwhite.net and theopencenter.org. And on Twitter, you can be reached at Ralph underscore White. This, you've been just an absolute delight. And I, I love sharing your work with our, with our listeners. Um, we only have about like 10 more seconds. I would love for you to just say one, one or two words about the global network of holistic centers. Yeah, well, we, we've mentioned centers here, uh, the Open Center Omega, but there are many all over America, all over the world, and we, we know each other. We've been meeting. I'm kind of the founding member of this annual meeting. We're going to be meeting in Quebec City, uh, where a new center is just emerging, but there's now a whole global network, and we're all aware of ourselves. We're all facets of that same diamond of emer an emerging holistic and ecological consciousness. And so I think, you know, the warmth the support, the mutual recognition that can happen through these kind of uh, get-togethers. It's inspiring for us, and of course, each one of those centers works with thousands of, uh, of attendees. So between us, we reach an enormous number of people. So I think it's just, it's just heartwarming to know that um, there really is a global movement, should we say, or a cult. it's not organized, it's autonomous. All these centers are autonomous, but there's a global awakening to a uh, different, more healthy way of experiencing life and building our societies. And even though it's still a minority, um, 
it's making its way into the heart of our culture. And to our listeners who are sitting in other parts of the world, and we do have many, um, there are centers. You just have to seek a little bit and you shall find. Uh, global. The global network of holistic centers are everywhere. Thank you, Ralph White. Thank you for sharing a bit of yourself with us on Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio. Here come the tunes. We'll be right back with another guest talking about the quest for meaning. We know that life can be tough and that happiness can and does live alongside adversity. We'll be right back to explain how on Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen. Harvest more happiness by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness, following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen, and tweeting us with the hashtag Harvesting Happiness. Remember what it feels like to receive a gift? We all know nothing gives happiness like a present, so you should unwrap yours at HarvestingHappiness.com and sign up to receive your free ebook, Got Happiness Now, that offers simple, user-friendly ways to get greater happiness in your world each and every day. That's HarvestingHappiness.com. Lisa Cypress Kamen has built an impressive global lifestyle management consulting company offering applied positive psychology, mindfulness, and integrated well-being coaching. Her services, including addiction and trauma recovery support, as well as life crisis triage, are available worldwide through phone, video, and on-site. In addition, Lisa delivers workshops, lectures, and trainings to corporations and institutions and is a frequent guest expert on many prominent radio and TV shows. Connect with us at Harvesting Happiness dot com for more information. Harvesting Happiness for Heroes is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation offering innovative and integrated stigma-free combat recovery services to veterans and their loved ones with programming that focuses on the transformation of post-traumatic stress into post-traumatic growth using scientifically proven positive psychology coaching tools and strategies that increase self-mastery, self-awareness, and self-esteem to help heal the invisible wounds of war. To make a tax-free charitable contribution or to learn more, please visit Visit hh4heroes.org. Welcome back to Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen, the show dedicated to promoting happiness from the inside out by thriving with passion, purpose, place, and meaning. So let's get back to the show and your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen. Welcome back to Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio. If you're just joining us now, we are talking about life on purpose, the quest for meaning along the way. And with me now is Michael Weesey, who has worked for over 35 years bringing forth films, videos, books, and television programs. He has experience both in the executive corporate level and as an independent producer and director. His company, Michael Weesey Productions, is the world's leading publisher of books on filmmaking and screenwriting with over 200 titles, which are used in over 700 film schools throughout the, the world. Five years ago, along with his wife, Geraldine, he launched Divine Arts a book imprint devoted to self-transformation and plant medicine books. His recent personal journey films shot in Tibet, Peru, and Bali include The Sacred Sites of the Dalai Lamas, The Shaman and Ayahuasca, Living with Spirits, and Talking with Spirits. He and his family have lived in Cornwall for the last 18 years. His most recent book, Onward and Upward, Reflections of a Joyful Life, are his memoirs, which received two top publishing awards for Best Autobiography of 2013 from Cover and Best Memoir 2013 from Choice. Eight years ago, Michael was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and tried a variety of treatments from high-tech stem cell transfer to Amazonian plant medicines to work to working with the martial arts masters in Israel. Wanting to share his breakthrough discoveries, he published Goodbye Parkinson's Hello Life, which for the last two months has been the number one best-selling book in its category on Amazon. And without further ado, welcome, Michael, very much alive and on purpose. My goodness. Thank you, Lisa. What has led you to follow such an unusual life course? Well, I, as I say in the book, I, I was always looking for the secret of life. And, uh, you know, 
even as a, as a young child, I was trying to understand how the world worked. And uh, so that just led me, you know, from one thing to the next. And the filmmaking and the publishing just kind of track that exploration. You know, I mean, the great thing I was able to figure out how to do was to live my life, have my experiences, and monetize it through the selling of, of books and television shows and, and like that. So, so very... I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to, to talk, uh, throw out the word there, authenticity, because that's what's just popped into my mind. Well, yeah, I try to keep them true to, and, and useful for other people. I think the main thing is, uh, I was listening to your show that you had on before this one, and, and you know, we were talking about marketing and that sort of thing. I think what people want more than anything else is information that they can use. So these books aren't about me, per se, or... Or, or authors per se, but they empower the, the reader. And I think the more we can contribute to one another and benefit one another, the more successful one is just naturally in business. So the business sort of takes care of itself if you're able to, um, you know, experience something that other people haven't articulated in some media form and share it with the world. You uh, were in San Francisco in the 60s which I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if that blows your cover that you're not really 39, but that's okay, neither am I. So let's talk a little bit those early days in the 60s and what that was like and how it contributed to the story that you are telling and, and your journey. Well, the, the 60s, it was all up for grabs. There wasn't, wasn't an area of life that wasn't being uh, looked at and changed by, by the younger generation. And not that they got it right, or not that we got it right every time, but at least you know we, we came out of the 50s, which is a very uh, prohibitive, uh, repressed time, into a sort of you know no rules, you know have fun, do what you want as long as nobody gets hurt, philosophy. And so this was expressed through you know underground movies and through uh, music and and uh, certainly through politics. It was like you know let's reinvent everything, and. Uh, and then add psychedelics to that, which led people into whole new realities, which hadn't really been fully acknowledged before. It changed the playing field. And, and I mean, you think about yoga, which, for example, as something that was very new in the 60s. And people didn't really know what it was and, and, and poo-pooed it. And you know, nowadays, you find a yoga studio in every you know, shopping center in the country. So a lot of the things that were... Um, discovered in the 60s are now part of daily life. I mean, it's really, it's really transformed this next couple of generations. Indeed, indeed. And, you know, I'm, I'm noticing, I'm hearing the sounds of life in the background uh, of where you're sitting. And you are coming to us today from London. And it reminds me how small the world is, the fact that you're sitting there, I'm sitting here, and we are having a virtual cup of tea in conversation about something that we share in common, you know, a, de- a, a, a desire and a view of the world that is, that, is, that is similar. You know, we're very different people. And yet what brings us together, if we're talking about marketing strategy you know, in business, is this, this notion that we want to create a better world in which to live. Yep. That's, that, that underlines it right there. Yes. It does. Um, which spiritual teachers have impressed you most by their integrity and wisdom? Well, I've met many spiritual teachers and masters, but I think the one that was most influential would not call himself a spiritual master. He would call himself a design engineer, and that was Buckminster Fuller, who, as some people know, is, uh, you know created the geodesic dome and geodesic and synergetic mathematics. He uh, was the first to use the word uh, spaceship Earth in describing our place. You know. uh, he talked about uh, coming from universe. He said, "Whenever you set out to do something, come from universe. You know, start with universe, mm. because usually what we do is we start with ourself, and we feel separate, and we don't feel a connection to the world or the universe. And if you start from universe, uh, you you are dealing with really big uh, universal principles, and you really." Uh, find an entirely different relationship with uh, yourself and other people in the world at large. And I, you know, you this know. is important. This uh, come from come from universe. 
you know, for those people who are listening, who uh, have a challenged relationship, let's say, with the concept of spirituality, I think this offers a brilliant perspective. You know, if things aren't working for you, that's because you're not in harmony with you know, the world and, and the universe as it is. And all you have to do is shift your, or reframe your, um, your glasses to be bigger, and then all of a sudden you're bigger, and it's it's extraordinary how big human beings really are, but they seem to be afraid to step up to that and acknowledge that, and and you know we feel separate, we feel not part of things, we don't understand why our life isn't working, our relationships aren't working, and it's because we're we've got it framed uh, different, you know, we've got it framed inaccurately, and I discovered that certainly when I discovered I had Parkinson's, of course I had Parkinson's, I haven't been living in in uh, confluence with uh, the world is, you know, I was poison, poisoning myself and my environments and I mean, everything was askew because I was coming from it from a, the wrong, uh, I was coming from it from beliefs and not, mm. not experience. And um, so it's been a very exciting, you know, 10 years or so to, to have an entirely different perspective on who I am and where I am. Um, the Nature of Parkinson's disease, and I, I'm I'm particularly interested in this because my father has Parkinson's disease, and he and I talk quite often about what you just shared, you know, the the belief system and the relationship between the body and the mind, and you've done some incredible um, healing work in this area. Well, I have, and I continue to do so, and the big thing about Parkinson's, talking about framing, um, you go to your doctor, he gives you a diagnosis. I've, the good news is, uh, you know, you, you don't have a life sentence or a death sentence, you have a life sentence. And people go, okay, Parkinson's, I will de degenerate from this point on because that's what you're supposed to do with Parkinson's. And so you're framing it in, entirely wrong. And the guy I met in Israel, who, a martial artist uh, that I've been working with, who's been treating people for 30 years or having them treat themselves through sort of a dance therapy, uh, he says a couple of things. You know, I have Parkinson's and I'm a healthy person. So mm. it's, you can, you know, it's just something you have. And lastly, the diagnostic uh, work that the doctors do gets you into telling yourself a story that things are only going to get worse. And you've got to realize that your symptoms are kind of like clouds. And they appear and they go away, and they may not have anything to do with Parkinson's whatsoever. And uh, in working with him for a couple of years, I've reduced my symptoms, uh, maybe, you know, on a good day, 60, 70 percent. Wow. Uh, some days I won't even, I will forget that I have Parkinson's. Anybody with Parkinson's knows that everything you try to do, it seems like the physical universe is against you. So I try, when that happens to me, I try not to identify with the spirit of Parkinson's. I identify with the spirit of Michael, which is much bigger than Parkinson's and, you know, can inhabit me in a much more uh, healing way and allow me to do things like, you know, be in the world and, and you know, continue to be productive and, and creative. This is fascinating because uh, it, it takes the approach that I am not my symptoms. I am not my diagnostic code, that they are yeah. um, signals to me that something in my life that I have been living in the past is no longer of service, and how can I change it? I mean, that's what I see when I, when, in the case of my dad and you, exactly. and in people I work with on a daily basis, and then it is in this reframe that the healing work actually can begin. Well, and you have to take responsibility for it. You know, you got it. You get rid of it. You know, it's not a magic bullet. There are a lot of foundations that are doing research and a lot of people waiting around for a magic bullet that will erase it. And... Uh, you know, I feel sorry for those people because they don't they don't get that they are at they can be at, at uh, they can affect their own health. You know, they can take responsibility for it and and cause their their healing and cause their uh, regeneration rather than be at effect and be this sad story. You know, and get the Academy Award for having Parkinson's because they do such a wonderful act of uh, of shaking and you know stumbling and mumbling along. And I was certainly you know, do for an Academy Award for that same performance. I realized that you know, part of what I was doing was a racket because I liked the attention. Mm. So I, I got I got rid of that, and, and a lot of symptoms cleared up. But you know, you've got to dig deep. You've got to be willing to do the work, 
and, and confront things you may not have you know, had to confront before. We are going to go to a break, and when we return, we will carry on the conversation with Michael Weesey. To learn more about the amazing work that he does and Divine Arts Media, please visit divineartsmedia.com. On Facebook, that page is MWP Film Books, and on Twitter, that handle is at MWP Film Books. Here come those tunes. We will be right back uh, to carry on the conversation. We know that life can be tough and that happiness can and does live alongside adversity. We'll be right back to explain how on Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen. Harvest more happiness by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness, following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen, and tweeting us with the hashtag Harvesting Happiness. Lisa Cypress Kamen author of Got Happiness Now, is also a prestigious TEDx presenter. Her talks, The Mysteries of Fear and the Inversion Theory of Joy, can be found online at TED.com and on the Harvesting Happiness YouTube channel. Be a part of the grateful good. Grateful Nation brings together patients, families, friends, and staff of Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center to support the quality care and groundbreaking research at the Medical Center. Through new and traditional media, members of Grateful Nation share experiences, thank our caregivers and researchers, participate in sweepstakes, and gather to sponsor and host events and much more. Being grateful inspires others to be grateful as well. Isn't it time we jumpstart some perpetual gratitude? Visit Grateful Nation online to find out more at www.gratefulnation.org. Have a grateful day. Check out the critically acclaimed documentary film, H Factor, Where is Your Heart? An insightful visual journey from Lisa Cypress Kamen, showing that every person possesses the means to be happy. Follow Lisa and her nine-year-old daughter, Kayla, as they travel the world on the hunt for the universal keys to human happiness. Their question, what makes you happy? Discover the origins of human happiness, where to find it, create it, and keep it. Find it in our shop at HarvestingHappiness.com. Welcome back to Harvesting Happiness with Lisa Cypress Kamen, the show dedicated to promoting happiness from the inside out by thriving with passion, purpose, place, and meaning. So let's get back to the show and your host, Lisa Cypress Kamen. Welcome back to Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio. If you're just joining us now, we are carrying on a wonderful conversation with Michael. We see on, about living life on purpose, the quest for meaning along the way. So Michael was sharing with us prior to the break a little bit about his Parkinson's diagnosis and the paradigm shift that he chose to make in service to his healing, in service to personal discovery, and most certainly, it sounds like, Michael, your growth. It's all been about that. I thought when I hit 60, I would just kick back in a, what are they called, a lazy boy and watch TV, watch PBS or something, but it's been quite the opposite. I've been all around the world, you know, in part to try and find healing for my Parkinson's. Um, and it's taken me through stem cell surgery and, and uh, you know, a variety of things. It took me to the Amazon uh, when I discovered that in the 20s, uh, they were using ayahuasca to treat Parkinson's successfully, but the, the pharmaceutical companies couldn't figure out how to make money off of it, so they dropped it. So the next thing I did, did was I found myself you know, down the river, down the Amazon in, in the jungle with a wonderful man, Don Jose Campos, who is an ayahuascaro, and he deals with this plant medicine that is extraordinarily powerful and uh, can bring you healing at, at every level physical, emotional, psychological. And it's it's both the most powerful thing I've ever done and the most scary thing I've ever done and the greatest thing I've ever done because it's brought profound change in, into my life at every, at every level. For those of our listeners who might not know what ayahuasca is, and my guess is there are many, um, it, it, it is a psychedelic um, plant that is administered 
uh, by a very well-trained shaman. And, and you should and could elaborate on this because I am not as familiar as you. Um, and talk a little bit about the ceremony and ritual, which uh, it seems to me pl- is, plays a big part of the healing process. Well, certainly you, you need to find a, a shaman who, or, uh, who can administer the, the, whole, the whole set and setting. There are a lot of uh, Westerners that are learning to use ayahuasca, but there's also a lot of really bad practice going on. So first step is to find somebody that you really trust because your life is in their hands. And you, you go into a, a, a sort of a, a big hut with you know, 20 other people and sit in a circle and each, uh, each one goes up to a shaman and he pours you a little shot glass of the most vile tasting liquid you've ever uh, imagined. I mean, it's like I, I'm getting sick even thinking about it. It's very hard to take and you most certainly will get nauseous and there's also a lot of purging that goes on. And yet at the same time it produces... Uh, profound healing I found for me that what's amazing about ayahuasca is it it teaches you uh, about the plant world it teaches you about ecology Um, it 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 completely changes your world view and you learn that you can communicate with these plants because they all have consciousness and you realize that everything has consciousness and you can communicate with everything and with with ayahuasca uh, it's a, it's a, they call it mother ayahuasca because it has a feminine quality to it, like a motherly quality, a nurturing quality to it. Yet she can be really brutal too in, in bringing forth, the, showing you the truth of, of the nature of reality. And I found that she would talk to me using my own voice or use her voice or use a lot of imagery because I'm a visual person. She uses a lot of narrative uh, and, and symbolic uh, imagery. And I have just the most profound visions that are more real than waking reality. I mean, the way we walk around now is kind of a fuzzy slideshow compared to what ayahuasca showed me. And and you can open your eyes and you can see both levels of reality. I mean, so you find out that there's multiple dimensions that we live in. And behind this very thin membrane is the portal to these other vast other worlds, just uh, you know, unbelievable in their beauty and in their terror, their hell worlds and their heaven worlds, and their every animal and in, in mythology shows up. Uh, I mean, it's just an extraordinary big picture. You know, the closest thing I've seen to it in movies is Avatar, but that's that's not even <laughs> lukewarm compared to what this is. And and it's different from the psychedelics of the '60s in that you can have a relationship to it and and teach. It's a teaching plant. And what's really curious and ironic is that, you know, we've screwed up the earth and polluted the earth so bad that it's now taking a plant teacher with four and a half billion years of knowledge to come forth and to teach us how to save ourselves. Mm. I mean, it's just like... And and ayahuasca um, has many applications. I had not known about um, the nature of treating Parkinson's disease. I do know about it for dealing with addiction dealing with post-traumatic stress, that people are finding um, relief and healing in this modality. And um, I'm questioned about it constantly with the young adults I see in my practice who are struggling with addiction recovery. And I'm not in a position to uh, refer or recommend them to the therapy, but I do hear incredible stories, I have to say. Well, it was not at all what I expected uh, it was not what I was necessarily looking for, but it's what I found. I made two films on it uh, that just scratched the surface of, of giving you an idea of what it, it's. It's such a vast, uh, deep space, uh, and it's very hard. It's very hard to do. You have to go in with the greatest humility uh, and and be open and be and surrender to this energy that. I mean, at times it feels like an alien abduction where your body is scanned and, and uh, you feel these medical, you know, these medical presences and uh, doctors that are working on you. And it's, it's very, uh, it can be very uncomfortable. It can be very ecstatic. And you can, but you can learn to deal with, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can learn to communicate with these other entities. Um, I mean, it sounds completely mad, and, you know, 
but there are enough people that have experienced this now that I think it's safe enough to say start talking about it in a very open and general sense because it's so valuable and it it changes who we are. I mean, it just it, it yeah. shows us who we are. And you mention the the purging, and I don't. We don't need to get into the details, but the concept of of being able to purge or release or relieve oneself of of their burdens, of their woes, of their grief, sadness, and and outmoded behaviors and judgments that one is holding on to, is the fix. It is the curative, physically have, and metaphorically. Yeah, you have to be. Uh, willing to go there and and you know all this vomiting that's happening around you. you you may not you know some people don't don't experience that i my i went on a diet two weeks before so my body was pretty clean and i didn't really uh purge up much stuff although when i did it was pearls and it was it was gemstones and it was you know these glowing rocks and you know so it's <laughs> whoa uh, okay uh, yeah it was <laughs> i should have taken it to the jewelry should have kept it taken it to the pawnbroker uh but it, it can be very uh, – it's, it's not a toy. It's not a recreational uh, substance. You, know, you don't take it and go to a rave. Uh, you treat it with the most respect you possibly can muster. And, and when you realize that we're living in paradise, you know, when, when the journey is over and you, you come back to earth and you look around, you say, oh, my God, we're in, we're in paradise now. And you want to throw yourself on the ground and weep and, and give the greatest thanks you, you can you – can, pull out of yourself. You've said uh, that the, the greater your consciousness, the more beauty appears in your day-to-day life. Yep, yep, yep. When we came back to our Cornwall and went go through our garden, the leaves, uh, the trees were dropping leaves and flowers. It was like the Rose Bowl Parade and throwing them at us and saying, you know, you got us, you got us, you understand this. And from then on, the, my garden has been like a great library uh, willing to communicate about all kinds of things, so it it, it changed our relationship to uh, the natural world. We realize we're a part of it. We're deeply integrated in. We don't live on the earth. We live in the earth. We're part of this exchange of uh, of life force. You know what we breathe out, the trees breathe in, and there's a symbiotic relationship. And our bodies are inhabited by billions of entities that that keep us alive. And they cooperate and, and work in the same way that jungle works. And, and contributes to our well-being and uh, enables us to have a physical body and and go forth with it. I think this goes back to what you were saying earlier about Buckminster Fuller's perspective of the universe. You know, that if we start with the universe, that we are of the universe, we are a part of it, not the center of it. And it, it allowed him to see, and he was the first person I heard that talked about this, that that the world can work, we can have a higher standard of living for than we have now for the entire planet. Um, it's just a matter of how we use our resources and how we view the world. And you know, we're not we're not separate from other people. You know, every time we are at war with uh, somebody else, we're we're harming ourselves. You know, yeah, we're we're, well, we're connected. And you know. the external war really is a isn't it a reflection of the internal battle? That we're separate and there's not enough to go around, and if yes. we don't get ours, uh, you know, we're going to miss out. But there is enough. Well, there is enough, and we are one. So, you know, you you hurt the earth, you hurt yourself, you you attack another country and, and flatten it with missiles, you, you you're destroying yourself. Yeah. And uh, certainly the goal of the work that we do um, and our guests do on this show is to. Uh, mitigate some of those effects to say, whoa, 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 hang on, there is another approach, there's another way of doing this journey um, that is certainly more peaceful and joyful and loving. Um, We have run out of time, and I want to give our listeners uh, your contact information once again. To connect with Michael Weesey, please go to his websites, and I'm going to give you two. One is www.mwp.com, and the other is divineartsmedia.com. On Facebook, you can find him at MWP Film Books, and on Twitter, that handle is at MWP Film 
books. Michael Weesey, thank you so much for being with so. us. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I hear a few thoughts before we part. Happiness is not a destination. It cannot be bought, sold, or traded. Happiness will never invite you to the party. Happiness simply comes down to a choice to show up each and every day in the world with passion, purpose, place, and meaning. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio. This is Lisa Cypress Kamen and my wonderful guest today, Michael Weesey and Ralph White, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio is produced in collaboration with TogiNet and KBUU and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange. Go out and make it a great one. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness Talk Radio with Lisa Cypress Kamen. Join us each and every Wednesday for a brand new broadcast and continue to harvest your own happiness anytime from the comfort of wherever you are with hundreds of free downloadable podcasts from our libraries on iTunes and SoundCloud. To learn more about Lisa's global practice as an applied positive psychology coach specializing in lifestyle management as well as addiction and trauma recovery services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook Facebook at Harvesting Happiness, following Lisa on Twitter at Lisa Kamen, and tweeting us with the hashtag Harvesting Happiness.